Welcome to lecture 14 on transpile JavaScript. And as I'll explain uh, a little bit later in this lecture, transpilation is a process of converting one lot of source code uh, to some other source code. Um, and that's distinct from compilation, um, which is converting source code into machine code. And as I say, I'll go into this a little bit later. So we're going to start the lecture um, with the ECMA scripts, um, which is a set of specifications um, that are implemented by the JavaScript language. And ECMA scripts in the you know, last sort of four or five years uh, has introduced a sort of number of new features which are implemented by you know, some JavaScript in some environments, some browsers, um, but it's a little bit of a patchy picture. And to get around, to, so to enable you to work in the latest features of JavaScript um, without breaking code in older browsers, um, then there's this whole sort of transpilation process where we convert JavaScript written in a new version uh, with the latest features um, into JavaScript that will run in, a, in an older browser. And that's what transpilation, transpiled JavaScript is all about. Then I'm going to introduce you to TypeScript, which is a way of adding types to JavaScript. And then you also need a transpilation process to convert TypeScript files into JavaScript files that run in a particular environment. And then I'm going to go through an example of TypeScript um, that will show you how you know, one way in which you could use TypeScript to write the code um, for downloading um, data from web services and uploading it into the cloud. Okay, so ECMA scripts. So ECMA scripts, or ES, um, it's a series of scripting language specifications. It sort of describes the features of the language and, you know, what various keywords should do under certain circumstances and that kind of stuff. And JavaScript is the most well known implementation of the ECMA script specifications. And there might be other ones, but people often talk synonymously about JavaScript and ECMA script because they're kind of the same thing. Um, but technically, JavaScript is an implementation of ECMA script. And what happens with ECMA script is, you know, experts get together, you know, from time to time, and they add new language features to address sort of buggy, annoying stuff in JavaScript, um, to add new features. And obviously, um, that leads to the problem that JavaScript gets more and more bloated with more and more ways of doing the same thing. Um, but on the other hand, it does enable you to write some much nicer, cleaner code if you stick to some of the more modern ways of doing things. So here's the various editions uh, from W3Schools website. So, you know, pretty much most of uh, last, well, all of last year and, you know, uh, last time as well, we're kind of focusing on, you know, sort of 2009 ECMI, ECMA script 5 or ES5. Um, we, which is, you know, the sort of core version of JavaScript that's in most books and implemented everywhere. But then in 2015, there was like a new version of ECMA script that had, you know, things like let, constant. Um, and then since then, you know, we've had more and more features being added uh, to JavaScript up to ECMA script uh, 2018. So it's not like there's a single static thing called JavaScript. It's a very much a language that evolves over time. So these are some of the sort of new and very useful ECMA script features. Obviously, there's many more than this, but these are the ones I'm going to focus on here because I think they're going to be the most useful ones um, for when you actually come to implement your coursework and probably in the future as well. And these have got many good features. Uh, these are good features of JavaScript, I think. So we've got the let keyword, we've got promises, constant, uh, classes, arrow lambda function definition, um, async and await. And I'm going to go through these quite carefully um, with some examples because all of the code I'm going to be giving you, or teach, you know, going through this, this term, um, all the examples, I'm going to be basing them on new ECMA script features. I'm, I'm going to sort of move away from var and, you know, callbacks and all this kind of stuff as much as I can. So the first feature I want to talk about is this uh, new keyword let, um, which is pretty much a replacement for var. I mean, it's very hard to see why you'd want to use var once you've started using let. So in ECMA script 5 and earlier, um, we're declaring variables using the var keyword, sort of one catchy, catch-all kind of keyword for creating variables. But the main limitation of var is that it had this sort of weird scoping property. So scope is the, 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 the part of the code where that variable exists. So the scope of var was either totally global, which, you know, can be it's, you know, very tricky when you're working with big applications, or it's, in, or it's within a function. It, the, the important thing here for the distinction with let is that it's not limited by blocks or these kind of moustache braces things, yeah? So probably easiest explaining with a little example. So here we've got uh, creating a variable with uh, var and assigning it the value of uh, first hello from my variable. Now we've got a conditional. The conditional's got these uh, blocks. It block, it's got a block, right? It's block of code. Uh, so, the, so it's creating a new scope 
in traditional programming, things like Java, C++, or whatever, anything that was declared, created as a new declaration within here, wouldn't exist once you left the, um, left, left the scope of the braces. So we're declaring a new variable called my variable with a different bit of data in it, and then we're logging out outside of the block, and we're logging out you know, what the contents of my variable is. And in this example, um, we're getting a second hello from my variable, because what's happening actually, even though it shouldn't happen under any sensible programming language, is that we're, my variable here is overwriting the declaration of my variable here. So instead of existing just within by itself within the scope of this, this conditional, uh, my variable is actually now got, got global scope or scope within a function if this is all existing within a function. So obviously there's lots of ways in which this could introduce nasty and annoying errors. So let um, solves this problem, basically. Variables declared with let have block scope, and they only exist in the block that they're defined in. So here we've got almost identical example. Um, we've got let my variable equals first hello for my variable. Inside the block, um, we're doing let my variable equals second hello for my variable. Uh, that's inside the block scope here. Um, and in var, this one overwrote this one, but with let, this, this variable here has a scope that's limited to inside these sort of mustache braces things, yeah? So when we output the result, we're getting the, the variable that's actually in scope, not the one that's in like a more reduced narrow scope inside the mustaches things here. So here we're getting first hello from my variable. So that's what we expect um, for in Java, um, and now you can actually make that work in JavaScript as well. So the general recommendation is to use let if you're using HTML script 2015 and above. And that stops you from accidentally overriding a variable that exists in the parent scope or in global scope. So it's, you know, it's a very sensible thing to do. So it's very, most of the time, you should, you should never really need to go back to using var once you start using let. And most importantly, don't randomly mix up let and var. You kind of vaguely know you should let use let, but then you forget half the time and you have some random mixture of that. That's just terrible programming, okay? Next thing I want to cover um, is promises. So this is introduced, I think, to, uh, in the 2015 release um, as well. I know I, really, I realize I covered it in the previous lecture on asynchrony, but I didn't really cover it properly. And I've been using promises a lot to get all this cloud stuff working, so I thought I'd just revisit it just briefly, make sure you're clear on it. And some of the other stuff, like async, the async and await keywords um, are all based around promises as well. So I thought I'd just reintroduce you to promises in case you've forgotten. So we've got ECMA script 6 is providing building support for promises. Previously, you could do it with third-party libraries, I think. And so you're wrapping. Um, what promises are is a way of wrapping an asynchronous function. When the asynchronous function completes, then you can call resolve or reject on it. And that, the main point of promises is that you can then sequence asynchronous functions. So you might have one asynchronous function that pulls data from a database or pulls data from a web service. And you might have a second asynchronous function that depends on the data from the first asynchronous function. So obviously, if you uh, run both asynchronous functions in parallel, um, then you know you can't put the data from one asynchronous function into the second one. You need to run, you need the first one to complete. You get the data from it and you put it into the second one. Yeah. So that's kind of a real one of the purposes of promises, particularly in the context of this course. So here's a little example. Um, so again, we're going to, so you create a promise with new promise. New promise takes its argument of function. The function that's the argument for the promise constructor has uh, two callbacks, effectively, uh, which are resolve and reject. So these are functions as well. And so this, this function here is wrapping um, the asynchronous function. So in all these examples of asynchrony, I'm just using set timeout as my example of an asynchronous function. So but this could be, you know, get data from database or whatever it is, yeah? So we're calling set timeout, um, and this itself has an asynchronous function, has a function in it, and this function here will be called at the end of the timeout, so after a short delay. And this function is called after a short delay, will then call resolve, this is the callback here, so it's going to call resolve and pass back some data. This could be from a web service, from a database, whatever. So it's going to call resolve when the, func when the promise has finished and is complete. Um, so that's what's called when it's finished. And then to use the promise, so there's two ways of using the promise. We can use the promise with this then um, method. Um, and when we call then, whatever goes inside the argument for then is then called when the promise is finished. So we call then, and then we call another function, my, you know, here. And so this function here will be called um, when, the, when this first promise is finished. And I'll show you later, we can also use a wait um, to execute and wait for promises. And so when, when it's called, um, so what happens, we call my promise then. 
and then when after 250 milliseconds um, we'll call this thing here console log and we'll get this output here so the next thing I want to cover is constant and you may remember this from Java I think you have uh, yeah, a little hazy on that I think you have final some of that which is similar to console constant and so the idea of constant is there's certain stuff in code that you never want to change and you're confident that it's never going to change. So if we use, for example, pi in our code, if we're doing stuff on sort of, you know, geometry or whatever, um, then we might want to define pi as a constant and we know that pi is never going to change, right? Um, so conventionally we use uppercase, uh, so constant name here, I'm using uppercase here because David Gamma is because my name's not going to change, right? Um, and what will happen when we try and compile this, or we try and run it, um, we're going to get an error if we try and assign a different value um, to a constant variable. And that's the true of primitive ones. I'm going to talk about objects and arrays next. Yeah, but with the basic primitive data types like string, number, boolean, this kind of stuff, if we do constant main equals David Gamis and try and assign it to a different value, Fred Jones, for example, um, then that's going to throw an error. This is like TypeScript generating the error, but it will also throw an error in JavaScript. <laughs> if it was running, if it was an ex the engine was based on the latest version of JavaScript. Now, with arrays and objects, constant works a little bit differently, um, and it sort of works a bit like Java, I think, probably in this case. Um, so, when you have a, a variable that's pointing to an array on an object, what that variable is pointing to is an array of memory. So, when I say uh, let uh, you know my object equal you know whatever it's equaling to, it's then creating a bit of memory, I think probably on the heap. Um, and th that bit of memory in is, so effectively your variables are pointed to a memory location. So when you declare that an array or an object are constant, what you're saying is that that array, that pointer, can't point to a different bit of memory. It's not saying that that bit of memory, the contents of that bit of memory can can't change. Yeah? It's only saying that the pointer will always point to the same bit of memory. So if we've got this first example, we're getting an object, person, I'm, trying, I'm declaring it constant, and I'm pointing it to, you know, nameless, brown age, whatever, I can change the contents of the memory uh, that's being pointed to by person here. So if I do person.age23 and log it out, I don't get any errors with that. On the other hand, if I create a constant person pointing to this um, piece of memory, this data structure that's going to be held in memory, and then I create a different object pointing to a different part of the memory, then I'm going to get an error here because I'm trying to change the, the memory location that's pointed to by poise person, I'm trying to say that the memory location pointed to by animal should also be pointed to by person. So I can't change the memory, lo the, date, the sort of memory, bit of memory pointed to by person, I can change the contents of that memory. Now this is a very nice feature, um, being introduced in, I think, I can't remember which version of JavaScript, but uh, you know, um, it's, it's available now. Um, which is classes. So, cl so last year um, I did that lecture on advanced JavaScript and I showed you how you could do create constructors. In this case, this is a constructor that takes it over for an animal object. So we said this animal constructor will uh, assign like the name, the age, and the species, um, and then it'll, and then you can also have, have functions to it. And this will return a JavaScript object um, that has all these as, uh, properties of it and the animal function inside it. Yeah, so we can create a new animal, return an animal object. And then we can, you know, call functions on that that will change the age and all this kind of stuff. And then we had uh, added the prototypes. Uh, explain now, you know, in this horrible clunky way, we can use prototypes to kind of do this kind of inheritance stuff with JavaScript. But it was really, really awful. And I can't imagine anyone really being very keen on using that. Yeah. Fortunately, um, uh, they've now introduced classes to JavaScript. And it's a much, much cleaner, nicer way of writing object-oriented code in JavaScript. So here's a little example. So I think, yeah, I've got, so we just declare, use the keyword class to declare a class. Let's go animal class. And then we have, you know, you have special reserved words like constructor, and I think there's getter, setter, this kind of stuff. And you can also declare uh, variables inside the class and give them public and private access and this kind of stuff. Um, so we have a constructor, and this is actually creating um, variables with, you know, the sort of name, age, and species. We've got a method inside the class. And then we just do the same sort of stuff as we did in the previous, uh, with the previous method of creating classes. Um, we do let my animal equals new animal, and then we can just call methods on it and lock it and all the rest of it. So much, much nicer way of right, using the class, using classes in JavaScript. Another feature um, I kind of really have to introduce because it's used everywhere at the moment um, is this lambda arrow function. 
So in ECMA script, um, we can use uh, this arrow thing, um, in, it's sometimes called a lambda function, instead of just the function keyword to define functions. So, you know, some people are a little bit obsessed about how much typing they do, so this has less typing, uh, particularly since there's a few sort of bits you can omit using this lambda notation. Um, it's not suitable for class methods or constructors because, you know, I, I don't see why you couldn't do that really, but uh, constructors certainly wouldn't really work because it's got a constructor keyword. But the real benefit of this, beyond the sort of minor sort of syntax, you know, sugar, um, is that with a lambda function, we uh, don't get a this associated with the function. It's a little bit tricky to explain, but I'll, I'll do my best to explain it now, yeah, with, a, with an example. But first, before we go into the this business, um, just talk you through how we use it. So if we, um, so with a standard function, we just call function, name of the function, and then the sort of smooth parentheses. With a lambda function, we can just, if it's a single argument, we can just put that argument, lambda function, then point to some curly braces stuff. Or, if we wanted to, we can actually um, eliminate the, we don't even need the mustache stuff if we've just got a single line of code on it. And then if we've got two arguments, um, then we can put the two arguments in the smooth parentheses, um, pointing to the sort of curly braces stuff. And if we had no arguments, we again, we'd have smooth parentheses, um, and then the arrow thing pointing to the curly stuff. Now, I'll try my best um, to explain the this thing. I think the code makes it clear, but, you know, in the explanation, you get end up talking far too much about this and this and this, and it gets a bit confusing. So this code um, doesn't work, yeah? Uh, and it's not really clear um, why it shouldn't work. Because what we have is a function here, and the function is a constructor, right? So it's returning an object, and it's got this.age, so, you know, it'll return a person object with uh, the age set in it. And then it'll also have, uh, I suppose it'll have a set interval function. Uh, maybe it doesn't make much sense, but anyway, it's calling it. So this is a method inside the person, and it's going to call, um, uh, I think we're creating a new person. Yeah, it's going to call set int interval straight away for some reason. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. Um, point being, um, we have... Uh, we're calling this dot age inside this person, which is thing object thing function, which is being created by this function. Yeah, so this is just like a bit of mess of this function stuff anyway. But this doesn't work. And it doesn't work um, because it can't access um, this. The this here is limited in scope. Uh, it refers to the function here, not to the function here. Because every function you create with the old syntax um, has this scope associated with it. So this dot age plus plus is referring to this function here. It's like it's creating a new variable. We don't doesn't exist. H doesn't exist here, so we can't increase it. So it's creating this not a number thing when we try and log it out. Yeah. Where, um, whereas what we wanted to do is refer to this dot age in the function that's containing the other function. So what you have to do in the old syntax is this really ugly hack. Okay. So instead of um, so what we have to do is create a copy of the scope. Um, that's outside the function we call it. We're sort of creating inside the function. So it's a function inside a function, right? Function A, B inside function A, yeah? So let's call it function B. So we need to copy, create a copy of the this associated with function A, and, that, and then we can then access that within the function that's enclosed within that, yeah? So this copy is fine because it's pointing to a variable that has this unique name, which is, exists pretty much everywhere inside this function. Um, and then that's pointing to, this, to the this associated with this function. I told you it's going to be a little complicated to explain. So we need this hack, and if we put this hack in, um, then this works, yeah? And we used that hack last year, or yeah, last year, in, last, uh, in the example on view, right? I couldn't get this to work, so I had this uh, function here, and I couldn't use the this scope in here to access serials because it referred to this function here, not to this function here. And so it all got a bit of a mess. So what I did, I had to create a local pointer to this and then reference that in here. It's really an unpleasant, ugly hack. Lambda functions solve this because there is no this associated with a lambda function, right? If I had a function here, this would break again. But because it's a lambda definition, it doesn't have a this scope. So this dot age here is the same as this dot age here, and we get that, and it works just fine. So lambda functions have some real advantages um, in terms of avoiding the, the, the this so scope that's associated with functions. So you can choose to have a fun uh, this scope if you want by using the function keyword, or you can choose not to have it by using the lambda way of def defining functions. Okay, and now we have async, and this is a keyword um, placed in front of a function to indicate that it returns a promise. So now we're getting seriously into the 
use of promises to handle asynchrony, and that's a big part of JavaScript now. So if the function doesn't return a promise, and we could declare it as an async function, and it's just going to wrap the function in a ret uh, what's returned in a resolved promise. So it, it, so it always works, but sometimes it's kind of trivial. And we, we need to use await. I'm going to explain await a little bit later. It's a nice way of uh, handling promises, but it only works inside async functions. So you need it async both to if you want to return promises, but also if you want to um, use await. So here's a little simple example. Um, so here we've got a function declared async. And then this returns a promise. In fact, it doesn't return a promise. It just returns, you know, J in the string. But because we'll, it's going to wrap it in a promise, um, we can still do the syntax we call then. So the function will resolve with uh, Jane as the result. So when, so this is a way, again, lambda functions, you don't even need the smooth braces or the curly brackets. We can just do result, and it's going to call that bit of code there. So when the function, uh, when the promise resolves, it wraps it in promise, which instantly resolves as Jane is the result. So it's going to do console log result is and then chain. So what this code is equivalent to is something like this. Possibly not exactly, but it's returning a new promise, um, resolve reject, and then calling resolve with David. Yes, it's instantly resolved without any asynchrony, um, and you know it outputs the same result. So here's a little uh, async example. So of course, so. We might have a function, so I've used this pattern um, in a couple of places um, in the final example. So we might, one way of having, handling asynchrony is have a function that does some stuff asynchronously, but instead of, you know, trying to sort of call, for passing in callbacks and all this kind of thing, we can have the asynchronous function just creating a promise that wraps the asynchronous stuff, and then a separate bit of code can handle the asynchrony and do the ordering and time stuff that we want to do. So I'll give you a more detailed example about this later, but here, um, we're declaring a function async, and we're just going to create a promise that does something asynchronous. In this case, a very simple, trivial, you know, creating a timeout thing. So it returns this promise, and then we execute that. Then when we, when we do my function then, it's going to execute the asynchronous code, and it's either going to produce a result, um, in which case it's going to call console log result, or it's going to produce an error, in which case it's going to generate this error thing here. And in case it works out fine, because it's resolved, so we get the timeout finished stuff. Now, wait um, is a way of uh, a slightly, so this is a sort of standard way of doing promises. Uh, I don't know when uh, a wait was introduced, but this is kind of how they used to be done. We have this, ex we execute the, um, the function, the promise. This returns the promise. We call promise then, and then we could do promise then, and then chain the thens in order to sequence the promises in time. So that's okay. But it's a bit like you can, if you've got five promises you want to execute, then it kind of gets to be a bit of nesting within nesting within nesting, and it gets a bit of, bit of a mess, frankly. A bit of a bird's nest, you might say. So a way around all this, you know, multiple nesting business um, is to use a wait. And this is a much, much nicer way of writing promise, promise code. So we use a wait when we're waiting for a promise to resolve. And the re if, the, if it's rejected, then it throws an exception, which is a nice way of handling errors. And so it's the same as promise then, but a, a better way of writing the same thing. And if we're using a wait, it'll only work inside async functions. It's partly why I introduced the async thing. So here's a little bit of an example. It's starting to get a little bit complicated now, but uh, it's, I think it's fairly clear. This, yeah? So this is the same as the other one. We've got an async function, and here we're just getting a promise. And it, what we're doing here is we're giving a promise a name. We're passing in a bit of data for the name, and we're saying that we want to wait at different times. So then I can show you a little bit more about test it's working properly effectively, that's why I wrote it this way. So wait time is how long it will take to resolve. So we're basically building a timeout thing that will call, um, that resolve the promise after a certain period of time. And what I'm going to do is going to create two promises, right? So I'm going to create one promise, I'm going to call get promise. So that promise isn't doing anything, it's just a promise waiting to happen, so to speak. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to call user wait on the promise. So when I call a wait promise, it's going to wait, call the asynchronous code, and when the resolve is called on that code, it'll return um, this bit of data here that's the argument for resolve. So promise on result is going to be the result of resolving the promise. And then we can log that out, so that's what we're getting here in the first bit. Timeout finishes, a passing promise is the name, it takes a thousand milliseconds to run, and then the result of the promise is just the name here, David. Yeah? Now the second part of this um, is I'm doing, creating a second promise, and, you know, and then I'm going to do await promise two, and out the exactly the same code, except this time the promise only takes 100 milliseconds um, to resolve. And also, I didn't give them to do this properly, but anyway, 
also, we're getting the promise one result here that comes from promise one and putting that into promise two. And that's so I can get, because maybe this is an example of sort of sequencing in time. Yeah, I want to get some data from somewhere using asynchronous function, asynchronous methods, whatever, and then put that data I've got back in, into the second promise to do something else with it. Yeah. Now, if I ran these two promises um, in uh, parallel, um, this one would resolve before this one, yeah? Because one's 100 milliseconds, one's 1,000 milliseconds. But as it happens, the David promise happens first, and then we're getting the data from the David promise being put into the second promise, which is then being uh, executed. So we're getting promise one executed before promise two, um, even though promise one, even though promise one takes longer to execute than promise two. So in this way, you can see we've actually got quite a nice, nice clean code without all this thens within thens. Um, it's a nice way of sequencing things in time and getting the data and organizing all that. So I, I really like this way of writing code. Now for error handling, which of course we do, um, always need error handling, um, we can just write a try catch block around it. So if the promise resolves successfully, um, then that's fine, we, get, we just end up here. But if it doesn't resolve, if we reject it, um, then we end up in the catch block and then we can output the error there, yeah, or do some other error handling. So I like this, I have to say. And then finally, um, we've got promise all. And that just lets, suppose you've got 10 promises and, you know, you could sort of work, work them through sequentially or do some kind of for loop, um, but the for loop probably wouldn't let them all run in parallel. So a uh, nice efficient way of running lots of promises, executing lots of promises and waiting for the results of all the promises is to use promise all. The important thing here is it's not giving you a time relationship between the promises. It'll just execute them all at once. Um, and then when they've all finished, it'll then resolve the promise all. So here's a little example. So we've got uh, two promises here, promise one and promise two. And we're putting these into an array. This is just slightly artificial way of writing it out longhand so you can see what's going on. We could have put this in here straight away. So we're creating an array of promises. And then we're awaiting promise all. And that's going to wait for all of these promises to resolve. Um, or generate an error, it should really be in the try catch block, and then, um, and then we get an array of the results from all of the promises, probably in the order in which they pass to them. So then we got promise, so if you look here, Susan here is 100 milliseconds, David's 1,000 milliseconds, so even though promise one comes before promise two in the array, it's Susan is getting resolved first and then followed by David, and then we're getting an array of the results in which the first promise, the results of the first promise are here, and the results of the second promise are here. So it's a nice way in some bits of code, you might have a situation where you've got to resolve multiple promises and you don't care about the time order, and then this would do this very nicely. So I've only really touched, well, maybe I've gone into a bit of stuff, but there's, there's many other features, you know, of ECMA script that's been introduced since 2015. Haven't got time to cover them here. Um, so this is really just uh, an introduction of some of the ones I think are more useful and some of the ones that I particularly found useful um, when I've been developing uh, Lambda functions in the cloud as part of testing out the coursework um, for this term. Right. <coughs> so now I'm going to introduce you to transpilation of JavaScript, which is what we're going to need if we want to use these new features of ECMA script um, within older browsers and environments. So you all of you come across compilation, right? We compilation is a process where we convert source code, like C++, into machine code, which is executed by CPU. So we typically write C++, you know, pro we typically program in a high-level programming language, right? You know, all this kind of stuff. And then compilation is a process that converts that high-level programming language into a sequence of very low-level instructions for the machine. So CPU, it works with, you know, machine code, you know, which can write assembler code and convert it to machine code, but it's basically a series of sort of push, move, you know, copy these kind of very rudimentary operations. And they're specified in machine code where each sort of, you know, hex combination or whatever um, specifies some operation. With Java, it's a little bit different because your compiling is converting source code into byte code. That gives it this sort of run, up, run anywhere property. Um, and the byte code is executed by the Java virtual machine. And the Java virtual machine is a sort of, is a executable running on the particular operating system. So that's compilation, um, and then with JavaScript, which I'm going to cover here, we have mainly transpilation. I think one or two people working on compilers for JavaScript, but most of the most of the uh, stuff with JavaScript is transpiled. Is all about JavaScript is much more about transpilation than compilation. And transpilation is the conversion of source code written in one programming language to source code written in another programming language, or 
source code written in one version of a programming language to source code written in another version of a programming language. And that's what's going to be most relevant here. So, you know, there's like a J suite compile transpiler. If you've got a bunch of, you know, uh, Java code here, you can transpile it into Java, JavaScript here. So that's like a transpilation process it's called converting one kind of source code in, into another kind of source code. So why do we want to transpile JavaScript? Well, the main reason, at least in the context of this lecture, is that we want to write, we want to use the latest versions of JavaScript, right? Because they're cool, they let us write clean code, they let us hand, handle asynchrony in a really nice way. But if we try and run those older those, the latest code in an older browser or an older environment, old version of Node, whatever, then it's just going to break and not work. Um, so we want to be able to, transpilation will enable us to write code in the latest version of JavaScript and run it in an older browser. We can also add uh, coding productivity features like types, for example. So we're going to have some stuff on TypeScript later in this lecture. And also, as I said, we may be, unlikely, but maybe we've got this amazing program running in Java and then we'll have this amazing transpiler that will let us just run it in JavaScript. It's pretty doubtful that's going to happen, but uh, you know, there's a lot of transpilers out there, so some people are kind of optimistic about that, I guess. And this is why we need, um, the main reason why we need transpiling in JavaScript, because the, as they introduce new features to JavaScript, or ECMA scripts have been you know, picky, um, it takes a while um, for them to be implemented by the latest browsers. Yeah, so if you look at, you know, this is like ECMA script 2015, and you know, two years later, right, we're getting support for that in Chrome, or, you know, ECMA script 2016 only got support for in Chrome and Opera this year, and heaven knows what support is in other browsers. So if I write some code using, you know, the latest features of JavaScript, it's probably not going to run um, in Chrome, or even in Chrome, right? In Chrome, you can guess it's going to be the most up-to-date. If you look at it here, Internet Explorer does not support ECMA script 2015, but if we look at these, you know, statistics, you know, still around about, to, you know, 2% two, two of the population is still using IE 11, or, you know, this is like pre-edge Internet Explorer, which doesn't support um, ECMA script 2015 at all. So all of those nice features I talked about in the previous section, they're not going to run Internet Explorer. And if you're a company, um, that's one in 50 of your user base. And that's possibly quite a lot of your user base, right? I mean, if you're using, you know, the sort of targeting millennials or something, you're all, you know, using Chrome, then that's okay. But if you're targeting maybe you know older generations running older older operating systems, or people just out of date, I mean, I'm stuck with Internet Explorer or something or other on my corporate laptop, for example. So you're going to be excluding an awful lot of people. Um, you know, one in fifty adds up to a lot when you're talking about millions of customers. Um, if you can't support IE 11 to some extent, yeah. So if you want to use the latest version of JavaScript, but you don't want to alienate you know two percent of your users, um, then you need to use a transpiler. Um, to convert the source code that's written in the latest version of JavaScript, such as ECMA script 6, into JavaScript that will just run absolutely anywhere. That's what transpilation is mainly about in JavaScript. And so the most pop popular transpiler um, is Babel, um, which converts ECMA script 2015 and later source code into JavaScript source codes compatible with all the browser's environments. So the website's there. I'm not going to give you a whole tutorial on Babel because I'm going to add TypeScript to the mix as well. Yeah? And Babel, I'm Pretty confident has like lots of cool plugins and all this kind of stuff. So it's a huge user community. You know, Babel's pretty big. If all you want to do is transpile JavaScript, uh, later versions of JavaScript to older versions of JavaScript, Babel's the, the right tool to use. But if you want to use TypeScript as well, um, then I think the TypeScript term transpiler is a better choice. And there's loads of these things, yeah? So there's a whole list of these things. You've got transpiling from different programming languages. You've got sort of fancy you know, more, of, you know, in theory, better versions of JavaScript for transpilers, JavaScript, you know, there's, there's a lot of this stuff. People have put a lot of energy into transpilation. So, um, that's given us, so far we've got the latest version of JavaScript. We need transpilation in order to be able to use those in order to browse and environments. And now I'm going to talk about TypeScript, which will enable us to add types um, to the latest versions of JavaScript. And it will then do the whole work of converting that whole you know, types plus latest versions of JavaScript into code that will run in Internet Explorer 11, for example. So what TypeScript does is it adds types to JavaScript, and then it'll transpile, um, you can then transpile TypeScript code back to ja ordinary JavaScript that will run anywhere. And we want types um, because there's lots of programming errors that can come in um, if we're not checking types. Now, TypeScript's limited, as I explained later, in that it only checks types uh, statically, like at compilation time, doesn't check them at runtime, but even then, 
it's a useful way of picking up, you know, some of the errors that you that you otherwise wouldn't see until you know until you have to sort of debug them in a complex way at runtime. There are some jobs in TypeScript you'll be pleased to know. There's at least ten pages on technical jobs. I didn't think that was bad. Often sort of uh, full stack kind of developers. Um, I don't know what they pay, which is, uh, you know, not amazing, but, you know, uh, some up to 100 grand, right? But, you know, you might have to work up to that, right? It might start at the 25 to 30 to 35 one. So TypeScript's compatible with the latest JavaScript versions. Um, so you have, like, stage three features of JavaScript, which are ones that are kind of release candidates. So TypeScript, the latest version of TypeScript, will be able to understand code written um, with stage three features, so that's all good. Um, so it's a good way in which you can use the latest language features and combine them with static type, type checking. So in Java, you must, you're very familiar with types, right? You, you can't create a variable without declaring it as type unless you use object or something weird like that, yeah? Um, and standard JavaScript, as explained in the lecture uh, last year, um, introductory lectures to JavaScript, it handles types dynamically, right? You use var or let, create a variable. And behind the scenes, the JavaScript uh, runtime will decide if that variable is a boolean or a number or whatever and try and interpret the behavior appropriately. And you can find out what type it thinks it is. I think it's using the you know, class or type something like that. You can find it out dynamically anyway. Um, whereas obviously we could write you know, better, more rigorous code if we could specify the type of JavaScript variables you know, in, our, in our methods and functions and, and variables. It's going to lead to fewer errors and more maintainable code. So there are people who dispute that. Um, Personally, I think uh, TypeScript types are a, a sensible addition to JavaScript, particularly when you're working with um, larger, you know, larger programs and applications, because you know JavaScript's a bit free and easy, right? And it's TypeScript's so easy to use, um, it's like why wouldn't you use it anyway? Yeah. So let's just look at some simple stuff. Yeah. So these are just adding types to variables. So let my name equals string type. We can just say that, that this this variable has to be a string type. A function argument, we can specify that the, what's passed into this function should be a string. Good if we're doing string processing on the, um, on, the, what's on the name, for example. And then we can specify that a function will return um, a variable of a particular type. So in this case, we're turning a string yeah, rather than a number or something like that. Again, very helpful when we're connecting these functions together into bigger applications. So I'm just going to skim through some of the TypeScript types. This is all from the TypeScript website. It's in terms of where it's formatted. So you've got booleans, uh, numbers. So all the different types of numbers uh, are wrapped up into the single number type. The decimal, hex, binary, octal, possibly float as well. It's all, it's all got the same type number. And then string, arrays, objects, and classes. So you've got this sort of, uh, sort of older way of defining array types. So you have the, uh, the type followed by the array, square brackets. Um, I kind of prefer this one, which is more like Java, Java, more modern Java types. So we have like an array, and then you've got these sort of angle brackets things um, with the type inside it. That's exactly, this works exactly the same way. Objects, you've got an object type, and then classes, you've got like my class, um, and then again, we just use the colon and then the type of the class there. So, very nice way in which you, we can specify and control types. We can also have the any type. So maybe you don't know the type of a variable um, because you're working with legacy code or third-party library or something. Um, and that just says we're not going to check the type of this variable. So we can just use declare it as any type and then you can assign anything you like to it. Void, mainly used when you, we have a function that doesn't return anything and we want to specify that it doesn't return anything. Um, so in this case, we can have the void type and there's various sort of messy, messy bits of void and undefined, but which are decided it wasn't really worth going into. We can also combine types. So suppose we've got a, an ID here, and the ID might be a string or a number. Then we can do that using the sort of vertical line to say that this ID can be a string or a number, but it can't be uh, like a Boolean or a class or something like that. Yeah. Again, I'm not going to go through all the details. All I'm expecting you um, with your coursework too is to, is to add types to your programs. Yeah. And there are lots of very fancy, complicated things to do with types and TypeScript, but you know. Um, I'm, you know, it's only 10 marks or whatever, so I'm only expecting you to use the basics here and get the transpilation working, and then I'll be happy, yeah? So there are some limitations. TypeScript's not going to, you know, make your breakfast for you, right? Um, it's static type by type checker. It's only checking type consistency within static code. And it doesn't check that the type's correct at runtime. I wrote a little bit of code to check that. It doesn't do it. And it can't do it because TypeScript's being transpiled to JavaScript, yeah? So, um, so you know, if you've got, for example... A function here, let's just find an example, that says ID, string, or number. 
when it's compiled, it'll check everything within the code to see that it's not passing in a string or number. Um, but then when it's actually compiled, it'll just get rid of that stuff. So the actual JavaScript that's running at runtime won't be checking the types. And it transpiles down to stuff that, you know, is, is ordinary JavaScript, can be a bit, you know, quite complicated ordinary JavaScript. And there may be some bugs or complicated things that are difficult to fish out at runtime with particularly with large amounts of code. And one thing people perceive as a limitation of TypeScript is that you have to choose between TypeScript and Babel. And so Babel is like really popular transpiler, has lots of plugins, um, whereas TypeScript probably doesn't have as many. So if you, you know, you, you're not going to bother using both of these things, although you probably could. Um, so you have to choose, and some people will choose to use Babel and skip the types. Right, so explain how TypeScript works, which is very easy, really. Now I'm going to explain how you can actually you know, run, do the stuff of transpiling TypeScript into JavaScript and checking for errors and all that. So you could transpile TypeScript with Babel. Babel will strip out the types for you, but it won't do the type checking. And that's why you need to use TypeScript if you want to use type, types properly um, with JavaScript. So it's better to use TypeScript transpiler. Pretty easy to use. You just install it globally, because otherwise you can't call it from the command line. So npm install g TypeScript. And so if you've got a single file you want to transpile, you just type tsc TypeScript compiler and then specify the file. And if there's no errors, just generate a JavaScript file in the same directory with the same name. Dead easy. You typically are not going to be doing this um, because what you what people generally use is a tsconfig.json uh, file, and that controls the transpilation process um, for TypeScript. So you put it in your project directory, specifies TypeScript options, the files you want to transpile, that kind of stuff. And if you call all TSC with no input files, it'll look for this tsconfig JSON, uh, starting in the current directory, moving up directory chain, and um, it'll only Usually it'll just use that, but if you specify, if you do it, call it in this way, it'll ignore, it'll ignore tsconfig and just compile or transpile the input file that's specified. And tsconfigs like uh, POM XML that Navin uses, or make with, uh, you know, GCC, or, you know, QMake, whatever it is, you know, pretty much every programming language um, with any complexity um, will have some kind of build file or combination of build files that allow the, that control the build process. And that's exactly what tsconfig is here. So here's a few examples. So tsconfig uh, typically have compiler options about where you want to, uh, you know, the sort of target language, all this kind of stuff. You can specify a list of files, but better, you can do like include, exclude, um, and that way you can specify directories that you want to transpile, like source directories, something like that. Um, IDEs um, would typically uh, want to use uh, a tsconfig file because then you can specify the build, how the IDE should do the build process for you, right? And both Visual Studio and WebStorm have this very good integration with TypeScript. It's very nice to use. Um, that lets you view TypeScript errors, compile the JavaScript automatically on save, it'll even display errors just when you're playing around with the code without saving it. And these IDEs are going to use type tsconfig JSON to configure the build. I mean, maybe they work without that, but um, why bother, right? It's better to have this tsconfig JSON thing there. So if you want a basic starting version, on WebStorm you can just do new tsconfig JSON and just create a new TypeScript, you create a new sort of bare bones uh, tsconfig. Um, on this example here, I added a couple of lib files because I wanted to, do, to get my simple example running. Um, I need to specify the version. I want to use set timeout, so I needed, um, I think I needed DOM or one of these things anyway to make it work. And then I also, you can also specify the target language you want to aim at. Do you want to run on the IE 11? Probably need ES 5. Um, and you also, also want to exclude the node modules. You want to try and compile or transpile all the node modules. A big, big nightmare. And I've included a version of this um, with my example code on the course website. So if you're using TypeScript with WebStorm, just use NPM to install TypeScript globally. globally I've kind of explained that previous slide. Create a new empty project. Create a, a tsconfig JSON file. Create a new file with TS extension. And then you need to fiddle with a little bit with the TypeScript settings so it'll automatically rebuild every time you save it. Um, and the JavaScript file will automatically generate it for you. Very, very easy to use. And then you just run the JavaScript file. That's good thing. So here we have a little example in WebStorm. So we have an empty folder called it TypeScript 2. I right click on it, click new, type tsconfig.json uh, file. It'll only let you create a new tsconfig.json file if there isn't one already. Yeah? 
So we do that, we generate the default one, and then we can do new TypeScript file, very easy. And then if we go into the settings of TypeScript, um, we've got this TypeScript language service, which is scanning the TypeScript files as I'm editing them and checking them for errors. I want to click uh, recompile and changes here so that it'll, when I change it, it'll recompile the thing assuming there's no errors. And then the bottom here, we have a, like a TypeScript console. And as I play around with the code here, I'll see the errors here, um, which is, you know, nice features. And, you know, maybe there's even see some debugging features, which I haven't explored yet. So here we have the Hello World TS TypeScript file, which is written in TypeScript. You see the types here. And then that will transpile um, into Hello World uh, JS. You can see it's stripped out the types. In this case, it's a sort of trivial uh, conversion. It's done the static, static type checking. And you also have this uh, source map, um, which will, and the source map is a way in which uh, some, something that's running a, your compiled Java, transpiled JavaScript file can display um, the original source code. So for example, if you're looking at stuff in the browser, the transpiled JavaScript, transpiled TypeScript can look kind of pretty messy and pretty spaghetti-y, yeah? Whereas a source map will let the browser display like the TypeScript. I'm not I'm played around with it, so I don't know quite what it displays. It lets you display something semi-sane rather than the spaghetti that's generated by the TypeScript uh, type transpiler. So you'll also see when it transpiles, you get Hello World JS map, and the map looks like that. And you know, I'd have to look more into it to figure exa exactly how useful and you know uh, um, uh, this mapping stuff is. All right, so just a quick little demo, just showing the basics here. So here we have. Uh, here in my project, so we've got a function, say name, I'm specifying that name should be a string, and I'm just outputting the name, creating a variable string, and then calling say name. So first thing to note, if we call this hello, call this number, right? So if you look at the, here we've got the type script, and we can see that it's doing the static type checking, right? I've got my name number, and that's a string. It'll also create a problem if I call this uh, like three, so that's fine but then I can't call my name with my name, with this variable my name, because it's a number and this is expecting a string, yeah? So you can see it's very nice, it's picking up these kinds of errors. Even though they're in static type checking, you can kind of see that this is, you know, potentially very useful, yeah? And it's all doing all that dynamically. Now if you want to change the TypeScript settings, I'm just going to settings here in WebStorm, click on TypeScript, uh, languages and frameworks TypeScript, and then you want recompile on changes so you get this nice dynamic behavior. So, I've saved, so I've saved it, um, and it's, it's compiled it, and then we got this as a sort of directory kind of thing. We get this uh, demo2.js, uh, not that one, sorry, uh, blah, 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 hello world.js, that's it. So this is the transpiled uh, version of my hello world TypeScript. You can see it's not very different because it's very basic code, um, and it also lists the source mapping here. And so if my browser could access this, it could probably access this, which is the mapping file that would enable more sensible debugging to occur in the browser. Um, and as, as I will explain later, um, well, if we just quickly look, if we, here we've got like some you know more complicated code, and that transpiles down to something that's you know pretty much spaghetti, yeah, oh, it's intelligible but you know not exactly easy. Okay, so that was it. Oh yeah, and that's the where I'm going. Sorry. Um, and here, we, here we've got um, the Tice uh, TypeScript config JSON file. That's again in this uh, TypeScript directory. And, you know, we've got the library options and that, and this is the file that I've included uh, for you. Oh, yeah, and also if you wanted to compile a project, uh, wait a minute, where are we at? I'm just playing around with stuff. So if you just, so if you just do TSC, and it's going to find the TypeScript config file, and it'll compile it, I think. And then um, if I wanted to compile a specific file, I could do TSC, uh, Hello World, for example. And it'll work. Yeah, but if I did TSC, uh, I think it's demo 2, it's not going to work. Um, and the reason it's not going to work, let's just make sure it doesn't work. Yeah, we've got all these errors. So the reason it's not going to work is because the build is configured here. And if I just type TSC, it's not using the TSC config file. So to build, for TypeScript to, to transpile demo 2, it needs these libraries here. And if I just compile it without this, then it doesn't know which library to use. I'm going to sort of keep going back to that. All right. Okay. Yep. I think that's it. But anyhow, um, final thing, if you want the TypeScript to work with Node.js, it pretty much does out the box. 
Um, but you do need to install this types node and then use save dev. Save dev means that instead of just saving it, which I think it does automatically anyway, it, it'll save it in a development with a development flag set somewhere or other. So when you deploy your project, it won't bother deploying it with types node because you don't need it for deployment, you only need it for development because it doesn't recognize require, that's the problem. So you've got code that's requiring stuff, which pretty much all node code does. Um, that'll work, um, but only if, if you install the types node, yeah? It's just one line, one line of, on the terminal, yeah? Okay, so the last bit of this lecture, I want to talk to uh, a TypeScript example. So, so far, I've given you all these nice new features of ECMA script. I've shown you how you can use those by transpiling this JavaScript. And I've given you all these, I've shown you how TypeScript will let you add types on top of that. And the combination of these two things um, will let us write some really nice, clean, object-oriented code um, that's hugely better um, the kind of messy bunch of functions um, that you might be tempted to write if you're writing standard JavaScript. So I'm going to go through this example. I'm going to show you how you can use the latest JavaScript features with TypeScript annotations. Um, it's all dummy code. I'm just using set timeout as my asynchrony example. Um, but obviously in a real code, that would be asynchronous code that would be accessing stuff from web services or, st or storing uh, data in the database. So obviously you can extend or adapt this kind of stuff um, to do your, uh, the downloading of data and storing in the cloud part of your projects. Also, forget about the TypeScript stuff unless you wanted to transpile it. You can use similar code because you can run ECMA script 2015 code and above um, within Lambda functions. Um, so you can use similar code just without the TypeScript annotations um, in your Lambda functions and you'll find um, that that is probably going to be pretty useful, which is why I'm giving you this example. So here's my example. So here we've got using all the classes stuff, right? So I've got a class DB interface, um, and we've got a couple of you know variables, username, password, and the constructor storing that stuff just in standard Java way. Um, I've got a couple of empty methods that would contain the code for connecting to the database and closing the database connection, and then I've got an asynchronous method um, that stores the data. Now note that this doesn't just go off and asynchronously store the data when I call store data. What this does is return a promise, and when that promise is executed, it will then uh, store the data and then re call resolve or reject, and then or I can use await with this promise as well. So, so it's an asynchronous method returning a promise, and this is key to this sort of way of doing things. Then we've got a data downloader. You can imagine this is contacting a web service, something like that. We could pass in a URL, and this is totally fictional, this example, right? And then we've got another asynchronous function, method rather, that again returns a promise. It's not something that you call the function, the method, and it does it. If you call a method, returns a promise, and then you can use the promise logic, you know, await and all that kind of stuff to sequence the, you know, this, the actions there, right? Because otherwise, if this wasn't, if we didn't handle this asynchronously, and we called store data followed by get data from web service, or sorry, if we called get data from web service followed by store data, then they'd act, these two functions would execute in parallel, and that wouldn't work, right? We want to get the data from the web service and store it in the database. We need to sequence them, and that's why we need to get a promise and then use the promise to do the sequencing for us. And I'll explain that in a sec. So now we have the main, main, uh, main class, and you know it's got the instances of the DB interface and the data downloader classes. So I'm using TypeScript to say that this, this DB interface is a DB interface and so on and so forth. The constructor is then building instances of these classes. And then my async method, it looks, you know, nice and clean, right? So it starts um, by getting the data downloader promise, right? So again, it's not doing that. It's not getting the data from the web service. It's returning a promise to get the data. So we're getting a promise, and then we're awaiting when we call await the promise. You remember that that means that the promise is then executed. When it finished, um, this thing completes and returns, uh, in this case, the data that's being downloaded from the web service. So if you look at my data downloader, um, it's just returning some uh, some dummy data here, okay? So that's what gets returned there. And then I'm just logging out the data that's been downloaded. And then this data that's been downloaded, I'm then passing into my DB interface, right? This is what I want to do. I want to get some data and pass it to the DB interface. That's the whole point of this sequencing of stuff that promises. So then I can then uh, pass that data in and call it, get a promise from the DB interface to store the data. And then I wait for that promise to execute. And then I can call the result or whatever. And if I get any errors, 
I can call the catch from here, and then regardless of the result of the try and the catch, uh, regardless of the errors, I'm always going to call finally, and that will close my DB interface there. Yeah? So pretty nice architecture in my opinion. Um, and so to run that, all we do is create a main, uh, create a new main, and then call download data. And download data is this bit here, yeah, this whole, this whole method here. And what we get is we get data downloaded, so that's the first part of it, it's getting it from the web service, and that's the data it's got. And it's passing that into the database interface, and then that's saying data stored. Okay, these are completely dummy functions, but, you know, it, it's very similar code, and I'll, and I'll walk you through a little bit of example with DynamoDB and, you know, a particular web service as well in the next, uh, next couple of lectures. Okay, so just very quickly, I'll just show you, uh, show you working, let's demo two. So here's a, here it is, so, you know, how many lines of code is like less than 100 lines of code. It's got a database interface there, data downloader, main, all that, so when we're getting these errors. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, okay, right, so this work, so. Uh, right, so here's the sort of dynamic errors we're seeing here. So if we change it again, it's just standard stuff, right? If we change that, we get all the types of good errors. Very nice uh, error highlighting, I think. So there's my code, and if I save it, it's going to transpile it into demo2.js, right? And now you're starting to see that the JavaScript that results from the transpilation process is kind of messy, right? I wouldn't personally fancy uh, trying to, you know, debug this code, right? It's pretty, pretty unpleasant to look at, yeah? If you found some error in here, you know, you wouldn't really want to try and challenge it, and right, it's another sort of 30 lines longer, yeah? So this is nice, it can work, this is really nice clean code, It'll transpile to that. This code will run in Internet Explorer 11 if we really wanted it to. Um, and then, w and that's the code we actually have to run because we can't run demo2 TypeScript. It doesn't give us any option for that because it's not executable. It's like source code, and this is transpiled code. And the transpiled code we can run, and then it downloads the data and then passes it to the asynchronous method, all, all in sort of dummy way, yeah? Okay, so almost there. So as you know, in course work two, um, you expected to download numerical data and some text data, store it in the cloud, as well as along with the synthetic data. And the key thing about this is the code for upload, uploading data must be written in TypeScript, hence the point of this lecture, yeah? No marks for using Java or ordinary JavaScript for this. If you use Java or ordinary JavaScript, you're going to get zero, okay? So use TypeScript, get into transpilation. As far as I understand, a lot of sort of, you know, commercial uses or standard uses of JavaScript you know, involve some kind of transpilation uh, process. So kind of complicated tool chain. I'll hopefully give you an example of that in the Q&A session. So, you know, it, it's, it's time you sort of embrace the whole transpilation thing in JavaScript for me. So here's resources. Um, I won't go through too many details. Uh, so there's a nice, uh, nice sort of quite a funny article on how you should not write JavaScript. It's kind of worth a read. So I've given you that example code that I just went through in my example, along with the TS uh, config JSON file. And we're going to wrap it up. So in this lecture, I've explained some new features of ECMA script and introduced you to TypeScript and the whole uh, transpilation process. And the next lecture, I'm going to cover DynamoDB.